Good morning. How y'all? We're, we're lopsided. We're lopsided. Did you ever see the Flintstones? You see what happened when the ribs go into that car? It might happen over here. Anchor the side, soldier. Man, I'm glad to be back up here doing what God has so graciously given me the gift to do. I'm, uh, I'm happy to be part of a, just a, a, a continuum, a, a, a movement of God that's been going on for a couple thousand years now as faithful men and women who have learned things from the Lord have faithfully stood up and, and preached and shared with friends all that they've learned, whether it be here or in other environments, wherever they happen to be at work, in the gym, at the clubhouse, on the golf course, at work. It doesn't make any difference where you are, but you have to be faithful. Uh, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, he said, you've heard me teach some things. And, and what I want you to do is to take, I want you to take, te- take, take these things, I'm a little rusty, take these things and teach them to other trustworthy, um, some Bibles would say reliable, some would say Faithful. Take these things that you've heard me teach and teach them to some faithful, reliable, trustworthy people who will in turn teach them to others. See, so that's what when, when someone gets up to share the word of God, the things that they've learned from God, what they're looking for and what God's looking for is for some uh, trustworthy people. You know, people who he can trust to do what it says, to take what they learn and not only hear it, but do it, and then actually pass it on to other people, right? So, so that's what I'm looking for. I didn't come here. I'm not, I'm not too, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to hide. I'm not particularly thrilled about the amount of people that are in this room right now. But I am thrilled that you're here, and I'm just wondering, are you trustworthy? Will you take what God gives you today and take heed, don't listen to it, but just do it? And then take it and, in turn, pass it on to other people. See, that's how we make disciples, right? That's how the church of Jesus Christ grows. Not from coming in and listening to a sermon and going, hey, great job, preacher, and cracking me in the rear end with an attaboy and then leaving the same way. Trustworthy people are ones that hear it, they do it, and they pass it on to other people. And so I hope that you will be found faithful. I hope that you're trustworthy men and women who will, in turn, pass these things on to other people. I'm part of something bigger. I'm part of something that's been going on for 2,000 years. Like I said, faithful men and women who have shared the gospel, shared God's word with other people. I'm grateful to be part of this continuum that we, kind of, we saw a little bit of it these last two weeks when awesome men of God, Pastor John Abner, Pastor Theo Bob, they came and they shared God's word with us clearly and accurately and passionately, although I'm going to talk to Theo about his passion. He lacks a little bit. Maybe we'll have to get him a monster or something before he gets, in, gets up and starts preaching. But I'm so thankful that they came and they shared the word of God uh, in this very difficult season in our country when more than ever we need to hear the word of God to help us find hope. And, and our God bless our American mess, right? It's, it is it's a mess. Um, People are dying, civilians and officers alike, killing each other, hurting each other, stabbing each other, shooting each other, throwing water balloons filled with urine at each other and Molotov cocktails and total insanity. People are dying needlessly and there's riots and burning down buildings and this racism thing that You know, I don't know about you, but when I stand back and I kind of look at things, I'm thinking, you know, the needle kind of got pushed a little bit in a a good direction. I asked Pastor Theo yesterday when he was here helping us when we were holding signs out on on the highway. And I said, Theo, in your 55 plus years, have you... Have you seen the needle move at all? Is it as bad as it was when you were a kid? He said, no, 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 it's much, much better. It's not perfect yet, but it's better. And so I thought things were better too, but... All of a sudden, boom, right? It's all over again. Racism is running rampant in our country. And uh, 
just chaos has ensued. Like the, you guys heard of chop? You know what chop is? No, it's not anymore. It's, they renamed it. It's chop now. And it's, it's an area in Seattle where people just decided to take it over. And, and we don't want police and fire and ambulance in here. You're not allowed in these six blocks. Well, that's all great until yesterday someone got murdered. And they can't let police in there to find out what's going on. So there's a murderer running around free. It's insanity. Okay? It's insanity. So soapbox for a second. There's the Bible. There's the gospel. Here's your preacher. I think anyone who would defund police departments are absolutely moronic idiots. I'm just saying. I know we're not supposed to do this in church. But I'm just taking a second. Because someone some tries to break into your house tonight at 1 o'clock in the morning, and he's a big dude, and who are you going to call, Ghostbusters? Yeah, well, not all of us have that, and not all of us are equipped for that, and we have police, right? It's important. And, and so quickly we forget, as we praised our first responders when the planes hit buildings, and we praised our fire department, and we praised our police officers who ran into danger to save lives. Oh, they're so great. Oh, they're so great. And one schmuck puts his knee on someone's neck, which was wrong. I get it. And all of a sudden, the police departments in our whole country are vilified. Well, I don't know about you, but I just want to say that my next door neighbor, Tracy, who you, some of you know, he's a police officer in, in Tavares. And I texted him yesterday. I just said, hey, listen, man, with all this crap going on in our country, I just want to let you know that I appreciate you and the guys on that force. Thank you for keeping my family and my church family safe. Amen. And I would just encourage you guys. Yeah, you can clap for them. I would encourage you guys to do the same thing. Okay, there's always bonehead and morons in every walk of life. I get it. And there's some in the police departments. But by and large, police are, are good folks trying to help you, underpaid, dodging bullets, putting their life on the line every single day to protect us. There's a lot of things they could do for a lot more money, but they don't because they want to try to help. And so I think that an, an attaboy would be good. Just saying. So, so I, But I am happy to be part of, let's get back into this. I'm happy to be part of this ongoing movement of God to redeem the world back to himself and restore things. I'm happy uh, to come behind Pastor John, Pastor Theo. John started out, he, he started out with a, a very broad perspective, uh, and he kind of talked about the whole world uh, when he talked about unity. And I think that Pastor John really hit it out of the park when he, uh, when he quoted Acts 17.26. I don't know if you remember that verse, but Acts 17.26 says this, that, that God created all the nations. How many did he create? He created all the nations throughout the whole earth from one man. And we're screaming about our differences. We're screaming about our differences. We're screaming about our differences. But at the end of the day, God's word has to have more weight in your life than your feelings or your traditions or your history. If you're a Christ follower, you bend the knee to the word of God. Right? This is true, not what you think or feel. And all people from, from all nations were created from one man. And, and I love this. There's, a, there's other translations that don't say one man. They say that, that God created everyone from one blood. That gets a little more specific, doesn't it? You guys remember All in the Family? Remember the, the, probably the most famous show in, in all of All in the Family's history was the day that Archie, who couldn't stand black folks, he was sick and he had to get a blood transfusion. And he found out they put the blood of a black man in him. I thought he was going to die, right? He thought he was going to die. But the Bible, not Archie, the Bible says that God has created all people in all nations from one blood. So let me get a little scientific here for a second. If you do any research, and I hope that you do, you know the thing that makes us up, our DNA, right? Our DNA, the, our genetic makeup. Did you know? Here, hold on a second. Let's, let's stand right over here. I don't want to make you guys stand. We've got a black man, and we've, she's got a lot of different things inside of her, right? But she's definitely, she, she's definitely, you, can you stand up for a second? Do you, do, you, do you guys think that she looks like me? Well, what are you sitting down for? Come on now. Come on. Do, I understand that. Do, do you think she looks like me? 
Do you think, I mean, he, he's a man, right? But does he, stand up a second, Jerome. Turn around and look at these beautiful people. Let him see your pretty face. Do you, do, you, do you think that he looks like me? No, really, right? But did you understand that if you go scientific and do some research, that over 98% of our DNA is exactly alike? 98 she is 98% the exact as me. Please see, sit. You guys would be right. So 98% exactly the same. We're completely similar, right? So, so even though we're a little bit different, of course, but we're almost identical in who we are. Okay? So, so some would say, let's celebrate diversity. And I would say, yes, let's celebrate diversity. I, I mean, she is prettier than me. I appreciate your beauty. I appreciate his beauty. I appreciate your beauty. Everyone's a little bit different, right? And I, and I, I think that's great to honor and respect and appreciate and point out our beauty and our individuality. I get all that. But, but, but as you're celebrating your diversity, when you go back to the Bible to find truth and you read Acts 17, 26, the Bible would say, while you're celebrating your diversity, don't you ever forget your similarity. Amen. We are all one people, okay? So, so do you, do you, before you put the picture up, Michael, do you guys remember who Rosa Parks is? Okay. For those that don't know who Rosa Parks is or was, uh, she was a, a lady back in the Civil Rights Movement who, who refused to get off of a bus because she was sitting in the white section. And she's like, no, I'm not getting out of, I'm not giving up my seat. It's not a white section, right? It's a bus, man, right? So she, she, she said, I'm not getting up out of my seat. Here, bring up her picture. This is what Rosa Parks said. This is a direct quote from her, right? She, and there she is with MLK. She said, I believe there is only one race, the human race. The human race, okay? All of us may look and sound and act and, and, and think and talk just a bit different. And I get all that, not only just all over the world, but just in this room right here, we're all a little bit different. But we're all made from the same blood, and we're all made, all of us, made in the image of God, Right? All of us are made in the image of God. No matter who you are, no matter what nation you live in, no matter what color you are, no matter what gender you are, no matter what age you are, no matter how rich or poor you are, the, the, the most powerful, wealthy man on the earth is no more valuable than the, than the homeless man by himself in a tent in the woods. Every single one of us and everyone in between Every one of us is made in God's image. That means we all have value and worth and equal value and worth, okay? This is, this is listen, this is not just an in-the-church thing. This is a 7 billion strong, every human being on earth thing. We're all made in God's image. We all have value and worth. We're all equally valuable. And in God's eyes, he sees beauty, even when I'm standing next to Amara and I'm ugly, he sees beauty. Praise God, my wife does too. She was definitely made in God's image. She is beautiful. This is not a church thing. This is a human thing. The difference is, is that in the church, which you are, you've been informed of this truth. And so because you've been informed of this truth, of the equal value and beauty of every single human on earth, then you are required, if not happily obligated, to respond and treat all people accordingly. Right? That's the church. We're different. I was thinking about this this week. What would happen... What would happen if one of the other nations in this world... Powerful nation, China, Japan, Russia. What if one of them was looking on the news and going, man, now's the time. They're weak. They're divided. Now's the time. How quickly do you think black and white people wouldn't care anymore about the color of their skin? They'd join arms and start fighting that common opponent, wouldn't they? In a minute. Right? 
All of a sudden, segregation and racism wouldn't matter. We'd be run. If my black brother over there had a big old gun, I'd be standing next to him. Right? True that, right? Let's take it to, uh, to the next level. We got all these countries. We're all fighting and hating on each other, right? What would happen if aliens, God, this is kind of wacko, but just, just to entertain it for a second. What happens if aliens look down and said, hey, now's the time. They're weak. They're divided. They hate each other. Now's the time. You think all these countries that are now fighting and hating one another would still be fighting and hating one another? Or would they say, hey, let's get together around the table and fight our common enemy? See, that's the thing. When we have a common enemy, we'll, we'll join on. We'll forget the racism, and we'll start to join together to fight the common enemy. But let me tell you something. We have a common enemy. He is the enemy, and he's trying to divide the church. He's trying to destroy people. And, and, and we're not picking up on this. This is where it comes from. The Bible even teaches us that our battle's not against flesh and blood. It's not against black and brown and red and yellow and all that. No, it's against the enemy and all of his little homies that are trying to destroy everything. Steal, kill, destroy, divide, devour. That's, we have a common enemy, but we're not uniting to fight the common enemy. We're fighting amongst ourselves, and it's wrong. So that was uh, that Pastor John. That, that wasn't quite Pastor John's message, but that was... Kind of big, broad view, right? Wide angle, looking at the whole earth. We're all one people, unified, right? One race, the human race, right? You know, it actually, um, there's, if you want to talk about race, racism is not really biblical at all. There's actually only two races in the Bible, if you think about it. There's Jews and Gentiles, right? There's the ones who believe in the one true God, and then there was the ones that didn't. Those were the two. But God did something with the two of them, didn't he? He made them one. He brought them together as one, right? Those are the only real races. We have a wide angle, and then we want to kind of zoom in, and Pastor Theo did that. He doesn't remember getting up on that table and putting that bulb on his head. You all remember that? That was pretty funny, right? His own little Pentecost. Pastor Theo was, was awesome. He brought it down, and Brought it down close, a little bit telephoto, a little bit zoomed in to the church. He picked up where John left off by informing us that if, if we, the church, come together, that's unity, right, together. One mind, one purpose, one heart, one mission, one Lord, one baptism, one faith. If we will come together in unity and humility and, and turn from our wicked ways, right, and we pray, Jesus says he'll save that day. That's just what he says. He said, I will heal. And, and so he powerfully explained the truth that, that Jesus is still here to save the day. Not, not, in the, not in the incarnate, one true God wrapped in flesh who stands up in a boat and looks at the storm and says, stop, and saves their hide. Not that guy. But now he says, I'm going to go away, and I'm going to, when I leave, I'm going to send you my spirit, not to be there next to you in the boat, but to be in the boat with you. And as his people come together in agreement by the power, say power, they say power, power, right? By the power of the spirit of Christ in us, we agree on something. Jesus says, I'll still come and heal the day. I'll still do it. He said he'd do it. He said, if we come together in agreement as a people and pray, he will hear us from heaven. He will heal our land. And so we began to pray for that this past weekend when Theo was here. And I want to do that again with you right now. Because he said what? Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, right? Keep knocking, keep knocking. Keep knocking, right? So let's do that right now. Let's, let's agree together. If you, if you believe that the Spirit of Christ lives inside of you right now, raise your hand, okay? So keep your hand up, right? Keep your hand up as a unified family, and let's come together in agreement this way. Father God, as your children, based on the promise in your word that when we come together in agreement as your kids, praying for something that is in your will, that you will do it. And so, Lord, we ask right now, that you, Father God, you would bring healing to this land, that you would kill this demonic racism junk that's going on, this chaos in our country. Bring peace, Lord God. 
bring peace and advance your purposes in this earth in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 That's unity power there, right? That's not uh, arrogant, I'm powerful. That is confident, Jesus is powerful, right? There's a difference there. There's a difference there. Now, the church, listen, this is Theo's message. The church needs to lead in the effort to heal our land. It's up to the church, okay? Republicans and Democrats loathe each other. There's an aisle here where, that, where they will not cross because they're so stuck. Both of them, I'm not saying which one I lean to, but both of them are so stuck in policy, they cannot come together. They just are not capable of doing that. But we need to do that. The world needs to see something. They need to see that black and white and brown and young and old and men and women, all that, that we could live together in peace. They need to, but you can't shoot for something you don't know exists. They need to see it, right? The church needs to lead. We are the pillar and foundation of the truth. We are the salt of the earth, the salt that is supposed to purify and cleanse and preserve and flavor and make the world beautiful. It's the church that's supposed to do that. Jesus Christ in John chapter 1, it says that Jesus was the light that came into the world. But then in Matthew, Jesus says of his disciples that you're the light of the world. Right? Because, why? Because now he lives inside of you. So you're the, we're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth, right? We're supposed to help fix things. We're supposed to be leading the charge, not the government. Let, listen, a new president, it's coming up in what, November or something? Like, that's not going to change anything. Let, let, a new president, a new congressman, that doesn't, that doesn't fix our problem, right? It doesn't heal us. That won't heal our land, right? And, and legislation will not heal our land. It's not going to happen that way, you know? Like, you know, uh, they made uh, smoking weed legal, right? Th did people smoke it before that? Well, uh, what about after? What if they decide to make it illegal again? Are people going to stop? No. They're not going to stop. How about, before, how about before there was this so-called gay marriage that's legal? Were people still practicing homosexuality? Well, what if they get rid of that law and say it's not legal anymore? Are people still going to practice homosexuality? Of course. of course they're going to, right? If they, before Roe v. Wade, weren't people, weren't women, desperate women, going down dark alleys to quack doctors and getting abortions with hangers and getting punched in the stomach to kill their fetus? Was that happening? And what happens if they, if they make abortion illegal again? You think it's going to stop it? No, they're still going to do it. Isn't it illegal to get drunk and get behind the wheel? Isn't it illegal to get drunk and be in public? But don't people still do it? Yeah, of course. And is there and has there always been broken people who are racist? And has there and always will there be good cops and bad cops? Of course there will be. Because laws are good to keep from anarchy, right? Laws are good or else it turns into Seattle. I get all that. It keeps us from being the, the, the savages that we are by nature. And I get all that. And it, fears, it, it instills some fear into men and women so that they won't do stuff. But laws, they, they don't heal us. They don't fix us. As a matter of fact, even the laws of God will not heal or fix us. They don't transform a heart. We need something more. Do you know that if you steal my car, it's illegal? So, so maybe the law that says don't steal my car is enough to keep you from doing it because you don't want to get caught and be put in jail. I get that. But that law and that fear of getting in trouble doesn't make you love me. Do you get it? You see the difference? Laws are good to keep us from being crazy, but they don't transform a heart. We need more than that. Laws won't fix us. Lawlessness won't fix us. Looting won't fix us. Lighting stuff on fire is not going to help us. I ask you a question. Stand up, my black brother. 
What do you think is going to be better? If I'm treating him poorly, for him to light my house on fire or to love me? What do you think is going to help more? I just ask you. You can let go now, you know what I'm saying? I like, I like your pink shirt, but we're not that kind of church. No, it's all good, man. It's all good. You look sharp. Just don't ever hug me that long again. No, I'm just kidding. Right, right? These things don't fix, right? The, the, the way that broken people, the, way, the things that, what can come out of brokenness? Except more brokenness, right? We need more than that, right? Law, laws won't fix us. Lawlessness won't. Looting and lighting stuff on fire. You know what fixes us? Love. Love fixes us, right? Love fixes us. So today I want to I wanna just build on the foundation that Pastor John and Pastor Theo laid just beautifully these last two weeks. I want to talk about uh, the results of unity within the church and how to get there. Okay? You guys ready? No, are you ready? Right? We just need like Michael Buffer in here. Are you ready? Okay, so turn to Acts chapter 13. This isn't part of our Acts, thir- our Acts study, but it's certainly in the same book. We're spending a lot of time there. The, the book of Acts is great because it helps the believer see and understand how we're supposed to properly respond to who Jesus is and what he commands and what he taught and who he was, right? That, this, is, this is what we're, we're looking in this thing. It's supposed to be a mirror. We're supposed to look, and if we look in the mirror and we see something that is not right, we're supposed to fix it, right? So as you're turning to Acts chapter 13, which we'll read a little bit in there in a moment, but while you're turning there, I want to note that when the church was born, and that's documented in Acts chapter 2, but when the church is born... You see people from all over the known world. Like, you, if you go to Acts chapter 2, as a matter of fact, I'm just going to kind of go over there. You don't necessarily have to go over there. But it says there were people from all over, and, and there were Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia. You see what I'm saying? Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya, Cyrene, all over, right? There, were, there weren't just people that were um, Jewish folks from Jerusalem. There were people that had that had decided they were going to worship the one true God, and they were going to Jerusalem to celebrate Shavuot, this, this harvest festival that God has commanded that his people keep forever and ever and ever. So in the Greek is Pentecost, right? And so they were, they were coming into the city to, from all over. Talk about diversity, right? All over the place. And they were there to celebrate. And when they were there, the Holy Spirit, boom, drops down. And through his people... He starts sharing the gospel with all of those people from diverse nations. And and so what happens there? How many people were there during this time? I don't even know how many people were there, but it says 3,000 people got saved. That's a pretty good day in ministry. 3,000 people got saved that day. I don't know how many people were there. I don't know what color they were. I don't know how many men and women there were. I don't know how many Jews there were, like real Jews in the blood, or Gentiles that had come to know the one true God. Like, I don't know that. It doesn't tell us exactly what's going on there, person for person. But 3,000 people from all over heard one gospel. So all these people had something in common. They were all broken and without hope. And they came to this place, and they heard one message of hope in one person, Jesus Christ, and 3,000 of them got saved. And so when you go to Acts chapter 13, you think, okay, now here's an established church, but after Acts chapter 2, they'd all come from different places, so maybe after they all got saved, they all went back to their little tribes, right? I would say no. I would say if you look in Acts chapter 13, you see an established church. Look what you see here. Among the prophets and teachers of the church, right? This isn't just the people in the pews. I'm talking about the leaders of the church, the prophets, the teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria, Barnabas, Simeon, called the what? What is he called? The black man. The black man. 
Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Menaean, Saul, all these different guys, right? If you do a little research, you're going to find that within that group of leadership, you have Jews, Gentiles, you got a black man, you got some that were, listen, they were very class system back then, right? Even more so than now. And so if you're a childhood uh, friend of the king, you're probably in that noble class. Like the, the, the rich folks didn't hang out with the, the lepers and the poor folks. So we've got all kinds of different people that are gathered together. All of them very diverse in one church. What unified them together to make this happen? The gospel. The gospel was, right? They had all come from different places. They heard the gospel of Jesus. And through this one thing, this one person, Jesus Christ, that unifies them beyond those other identification marks. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, the NIV says this. Both the one who makes people holy, who's that? Point to him. Right? He's here, but he's, every, right? he's God, right? The one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. You see that? And listen, look who's in the church. White, black, uh, dark skin, like Arab, Jewish people from the Middle East, young, old. It doesn't make any difference, right? Those that are bending the knee to Jesus, that are being sanctified to become more like him, they're all in the same family. Some translations say we all have the same father. It goes on to say this. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. So if Jesus isn't ashamed to call the diversity brother and sister, why are we? Why is, why is that video true that we open up our church service with that says that Sunday morning is the most divided day in America? Because it's true. And Jesus Christ says we're all the same family. We have the same father. I'm not ashamed to call you brother. So why is it that so many of us will not do that? Convicting. The church needs to understand this. We're all one. We're all one. Doesn't matter what you look like. Doesn't matter what color your shirt is. Doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter which gender you are, we're all one. Now, before we move on, I want to remind you of something about this book of Acts. These are the glory days of the church, right? This is when, 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 when the power was evident, right? Isn't that why we study it? Uh, no one's going to be doing any careful study of 2020 church in America, I can tell you that. Unless they want to find out how bad it is. Just being honest. Right? We study the book of Acts because it's the glory days. Thousands were getting saved. The power of God was there. The church was exploding. There were miracles going on all over the place. Right? So, now, certainly there was persecution along with that. Certainly there was some suffering even to death. That's Stephen preaching the gospel. gets stoned to death. I get all that. But we look back at the glory days because the church was powerful and it was growing and we see what it was doing and we're like, I want that just like that right here, right now. Everyone wants that, right? No matter what church you go to, you want to see that happen. You want the, the Holy Spirit to whip through here and make this building shake, right? You want that. You want to see the miracles. You want to see people coming that are, that are sinners that rush the altar and throw their hands up and surrender to the Lord and bend their knee to Jesus and become part of the family of God and, that, and water splashing out of that tank every single time we gather. We all want to see that, don't we? But we don't just study the book of Acts for historical head knowledge, although that's good to be informed as to what happened. And we study it to see what they had, to see what they did, to see how they thought. And then we compare that to what we have and what we say and what we think and what we get. And we need to adjust our lives accordingly. If you want the results of God, you have to follow the commands of God. Right? And if the church is different then than it is now, well, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his desire is that all are saved and come to an understanding of the truth, isn't it? 
Well, if that's not happening, is it Jesus that's at fault here? I mean, there's only two parties involved, right? I mean, there's only two parties involved. There's either him or you. Right? There's, I don't see anybody else in the room. Do you guys see anybody else that I'm, that's hiding? It's us, right? Something's wrong. And so that's why we study the book of Acts. And it's not to say, wow, those guys were awesome. That was incredible. It's to say, oh, 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 oh. So that's what they did? That's what they thought? That's how they lived? I want to do that because I want to see that happen right here, right now. That's what I want. Okay? So here's some truth. Here's some truth for you, okay? Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. Here's some truth. Here's why we, we okay, so we know the truth. We, here's, here's some real truth. We want to start adjusting our life accordingly right here, okay? Let's start adjusting our life accordingly. So, so in Colossians 3.11, it says this. Are you there? Tell me if you're there. You got a Bible in your hand? You ought to have a Bible in your hand. Don't listen to me. It's to sell cars. Look at the Bible. That's cool. You know, for some reason, Casper, I look over at you, and I want to start singing that share song just like Jesse James. I don't know why. <laughs> Strutting in a town like you're slinging a gun. Okay. Yeah. Don't be getting your boogers all over everybody, okay? It's all good. You're, you guys all there? Okay. Look at In this new life. Pause. In this new life. What do you mean? Well, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says if anyone is in Christ, right? If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. The old has died, right? The old you is gone. Behold, that means you can see a new person. If you're in Christ, it's a new person. So anyone who's bent the knee to Christ, he is their Lord, their Savior for real, then they have a new life, right? The old is dead, amen? And here's the new person. Okay, so in this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile. There's the two races. Circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Now there's this whole list. Like that's not a complete list, right? But here's, it's Paul's attempt to just say, listen, it doesn't make any difference who you are. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor or slave or free or black or white or young or old or man or woman or Jew or Gentile or French or German or Canadian or American or an Indian or Chinese. It doesn't make any difference. Look what it says. Christ is all that matters. And he lives in us all, right? Christ is all that matters. And he lives in us all. See, and we know it's just, that's not just a, uh, that's not just a verse to read and go, hey, that's kind of cool. We actually see that lived out in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 13, right? All different types of people. They all come together. They're all broken sinners. And they all come to the one Savior that unites them all into one family, right? So in this life, it doesn't make any difference who you are. Those walls of division in the church come crashing down. But how do we pull off this unity? Because it's difficult. Because let's just be honest in church for a moment. We're tribal people, and we want to be around people that are like us, or else they tick us off. Amen? Am I alone? Don't let me hanging up here, right? That's just the way we kind of are. And so we have to figure out, okay, if my nature is to kind of hang out with people that I like, that have similar tastes as me, similar restaurant as me, similar residence as me, similar color as me, similar talents as me, similar things that they enjoy to do as me, similar personality to me, that's just our nature. And so how do we pull off this unity in the church? Well, notice that it says that we're all different, right? We're all different. It doesn't say that we're all the same. It says that we're all, there's Jews, there's Gentiles, slave and free. They're, everybody's different. But we're all from one blood, right? But we're different. But don't miss this. Christ is all that matters. So let me ask you a question. You guys look like you're pretty smart. If Christ is 
all that matters, if he's used up all the matter, how much is left for everything else? None. None. There's nothing else matters. It's, listen, I say this again. This is the tough part for Christians. At some point, the Bible, the truth that's found in his word, has to go beyond rhetoric into reality. It has to have more weight in your life than what you think or what you feel. What you think and what you feel don't matter. Do you see that? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what I think. I'm not going to waste your time and have you come here on Sunday morning when you can do a lot of other things to come listen to this schmo's opinion. My opinion means zero. It means nothing. What's all that matters? Christ is all that matters. And this is where the, the preacher will get a little bit of hate. Okay? Right here. Because some people want to celebrate diversity. And, and gender equality and black lives matter and feminism, like I get all that. Everyone is important and loved. But all of those things are cultural, philosophical narratives. They're all belief systems that are cultural and philosophical. They're not of God's word. What's of God's word is that Christ, say it with me, Christ is all that matters. Say it again loud. Christ is all that matters. One more time. Christ is all that matters, right? That's all that matters. And if you're a Christian, then what this book declares as truth must outweigh any cultural, philosophical, traditional, or generational opinion or feeling that you might have. Because those things, what? Don't matter. Christ is all that matters. And so how did the church, the early church, the powerful church, early church that got some results, man, that we all want, how do they pull off this unity? We'll go back to the text there in Colossians. So we're in this new life. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. Just clarity here for a moment. I don't want you to think universalism here for a moment. And when you read that, that Christ is in all of us. He's in all of us that have the new life. Just want you to, just for clarity, okay? Those that are in the new life, that are in Christ, right? He lives in those people. Okay, now watch this. Verse 12. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, what's that all mean? Holy means, I mean, it's a lot of things. But it certainly means different, right? I mean, God's different than all of us. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. He's high and different and better and, and unique and alone. He's, he's, he's him and him alone, right? He's different. That's why he's holy. He's also perfect. But he's different. And since God chose those, now the context is those that are in Christ. So as he chose those that are in Christ, and you all raised your hand and said that the Spirit of God lives in you, so you're in Christ. So since he chose you people here at Revolution to be his holy, set apart, and different. If he chose you to be his holy, set apart, and different people that he loves, you must clothe yourself. What does that mean? I just say this. It can mean a lot of different things. But it can, it can, it can mean this. Like, I see you all right now, and what I see is your clothing. I see it. I see what you're wearing, right? I like your shirt. I like your suspenders, as always. The fashion plate of revolution right there. I see your clothing. What, is, what do I mean? What you're about to read is what people should see when they look at you. That's what they should see. That's what should be pouring out of you as they see you. They want to see this. So to pull off this unity, since you're his holy, set apart, and different people that he loves, you must, and that's not a suggestion, is it? It's a command of God. And I mean, you don't have to listen to him, but he just breathed the planets into existence. So I'm thinking you should. You must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy. Does that mean like really soft and I'm not going to show my wrath when they abuse me and do the things that I don't like and they're not the person that I want them to be. I'm not going to go crazy. Kindness, same kind of thing. Humility, what's that mean? 
consider other people as more important than myself. That's the same thing. He just keeps repeating the same thing, right? That means you're different than me. You're not acting the way I want you to. But that's okay. I must do this. Gentleness. Same thing again. And patience. Same thing again. Over and over and over again, he says, you've got to do this. And forgive anyone. Think about that. I don't know how many times I've said this in this church, and I keep going back to it, and it's probably until I get it. You got that person you having a hard time forgiving in your head? Still got her. Well, it says that you must forgive her. You must forgive him. It's not optional. And don't forget this is the only way we're going to have unity. So after we do all those things, check, check, check. Above all, so in other words, even more important than those things, as if they're not important, above all, clothe yourselves with love. That's what I said earlier, right? Legislation and looting and lighting things on fire and lawlessness and laws, they don't fix things. What does? Love does. Above all, clothe yourselves with love. Now listen, it's so cool how there's certain things that God's just going to do and you don't have to do them. He wants you to be an active participant in the process, but there's some things that he's going to do that you don't have to worry about. He'll take care of it. Above all, clothe yourselves with love. That's what you're supposed to do, right? Amen? Which binds us all together in perfect harmony. So you do the loving. He does the binding. That, that's unity. So it's not black lives matter or police lives matter or this person matters and that person matters and this equality and this. No, no, no. It's Christ that matters. It's Christ that matters. And he loves me and he loves you. And so because of that, I'm going to love you. <laughs> right? That's it. Like period, an, period the end. There's no reason to negotiate with God. There's no reason to change things. This is how it's supposed to work. Because of his love for you and because of his love for... Listen, he, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. He gave his son to the person you won't forgive. He, won't, he gave his son for the person who burnt down the Wendy's. He gave his son for the person who staked his son to the tree. He gave his son to all of us because he loves all of us. And since he loves all of us, we too should love one another. And all the characteristics that you see listed in verse 12 just simply say this. Let's summarize it. You don't have to be me. You don't have to be the same as me for me to love you. And if we let this word that we see here in Colossians transform our thinking and transform the way our heart bends, here's the results. You'll see it there in the text. Where one body, you can read it there, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, called to live in peace, and then above it it said perfect harmony. See, the, res the results are when we have tender-hearted mercy and gentleness and kindness and, and patience and, and forgiveness and we love all the people, what will happen to us? We are one body living in harmony and enjoying peace. Now look at the news and tell me that that is not the single thing that this country needs to see. What you see in the Bible is exactly the cure for the chaos that's outside those doors. Nothing else will fix this except that. The lost, broken, rioting, racist world needs to see a diverse people who couldn't care less about the walls of identity that our culture 
erect to divide us and to conquer us. Right? That's all that matters is who? Christ. That's all that matters is Christ. And we've got to get our eyes off of the things that divide and get our eyes back on the thing that unifies. His name is Jesus. And that's why the Bible says we run the race with endurance by fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And this country that God placed you and I in is so chaotic and divided right now and filled with hate. And so what I see is although we, see, we have all the chaos and the hate and the rioting and the killing and the stabbing and the, and, the, and the craziness, right? I see all that. But what I see in that is when the, when the devil does something horrible and he means it for evil, God can take that and turn it around for something good. And so what I see right now is this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for the people of God to truly push back darkness, to truly shine the way we're supposed to, and make a difference in the world. Okay, do you see? We're the light of the world, right? Don't, turn, don't do anything yet. We're the light of the world. See that? That's a light. That's us, right? And we're shining. We're always shining. The light doesn't go out. Whether there's good times, prosperous, up and down, war, peace, doesn't matter. The church of Jesus Christ is the light of the world. They're still shining, right? But look what happens when the world is dark and chaotic. See how much brighter the light becomes? We have an opportunity, church. We have an opportunity to shine like we've never shined before. Not because our gospel, you can turn it up, not because the gospel has changed, but the world around us has changed and got so much darker that the light of the gospel has, has the opportunity to be brighter. So the world needs to see what we have right now more than ever before. Now is not the time to shy away or get quiet, but we have to love one another to show the lost and hurting world me and Theo were sitting there out there in the lobby yesterday, and we're talking about all this kind of stuff together. And I said, you know what this world needs more than anything is to have a camera right in front of us right now, just sitting here watching as a black man and a black uh, and a white man sit and peacefully, lovingly have conversation. That we can actually do this without killing each other and acting like the barbarians that we are. There's no reason for it. We need to love, okay? Now, Love unifies. Love fixes things, right? So, I want, to do, I want you to do this. Turn to 1 John chapter 4. That's how we get there. And here's what, let's talk about the results of such unity. If we will bind together in peace, tender-hearted mercy, patience, love, gentleness, kindness, realizing we're one blood, 98% the same. We're all one family. We have the same Father. Jesus is not ashamed to call any of us that are his brother and sister. If we can do all this and we can come together, that's, that, I mean, that's tough to do. But something's going to happen if we can somehow, some way, pull this off. Heaven help us. 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. God is love. That's not all that he is, but he is love. All love comes from him. There's not a speck of love on this, in this universe that didn't come from the heart of the Father. So 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. But now look at 1 John 4, 12. Are you there? It says this. No one has ever seen God. God is a consuming fire. And he lives in unapproachable light. If you saw God the Father, you would be consumed instantly into nothingness. No one has ever seen the Father. But if, we, this is crazy. But if we love each other, think about this. If we can pull off what we just talked about. If we can somehow get beyond ourself and pull off what we just talked about. If, if we love each other, 
God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. Think about that for a second. Think of the weight of your life in light of what you just heard. Can I read that again? No one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. What's this saying? That the best and clearest way for a lost and hurting, chaotic world to find its cure, which is God, is to see us love one another in the church. Think about that. Listen, loved ones. You are the cure. You're the cure. Not because you're Richard, but because Jesus is in you. See, it says that if you love each other, then God lives in you. And so you carry the cure with you wherever you go. And the only way that they're going to see their cure, the best way, is not in the sunset, not in the Rocky Mountains or the Grand Canyon, which we see God, and we look up, and we see the stars, and they declare the glory of God. I get all that. But what declares the glory of God more than anything else on the planet is the way we, in the church, love one another. That's how people will see God. And then, and then do this. Watch what Jesus himself says. Look at John chapter 17. I want you to put your eyes on this, please. John 17. This is Jesus Christ actually praying, right? You get to go into his prayer closet right now. And in John chapter 17, verse 22 and 23, watch what Jesus Christ says. If you don't think that what we do here and who we are is important, this is about to wreck that. John 17, verse 22 and 23. Are you there? I have given them, so he's talking about us, his disciples, I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. Just stop for a second there. How... How would you describe the oneness within the Trinity? That's a good definition. Mm. Perfect. Have they ever had a fight? Do they disagree about stuff? Do they take their toys and run elsewhere? Do they, does Jesus go, oh, that Holy Spirit, he speaks in tongues, he's weird. Do they, is there any of that going on inside? The, are, they're in perfect harmony all the time every moment, for all eternity, always have been, always will, completely getting along, completely agreeing on everything, in every moment, in every single thing, all the time. And Jesus said, I have given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. Now, When you come to church and you hear the word of God, you're supposed to surrender and say, okay, that's what it says, so help me God, that's what I'm going to do. Now that, just that right there should change the way you act when you leave this room and go to the lobby for lunch with everybody later. That, That should alter the way you see one another that should alter the way you care about one another, that should alter every single thing that determines the way we interact together as a people. Everything. Amen. Preacher over there. Preach it. I've given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them, which we all said yes, right? We all agreed. And you, God, Father, are in me, 
So if, if, if the Father's in him and he's in you, then who else is in you? The Father, right? I'm just saying what it says. Now watch this. Now because of that, he's kind of telling you, like, listen, this is not that hard. Because you've got the tools right now. You've got the power inside of you to pull this off. If you get your mind straight and realize that Jesus Christ, by his spirit, and the Father are in you right now. And they're in perfect unity. So because of that, he says, may they experience such perfect unity. Now you understand, to pull off the unity, we just spent the last 30 minutes on how to pull off the unity. How do you pull off the unity? Tenderhearted mercy, humility, kindness, gentleness, forgiving one another, allowance for fault, loving each other. May they experience such perfect unity. That, now here it is. Watch this. Here's the results of the loving unity. May they experience such perfect unity. So what they experience here what will happen? That the world, so what we do here will impact that. The world will know that you sent me. And that you love them. <laughs> Think about this. How many people out there right now would come to saving knowledge of Jesus if they thought they were good enough to get there? A lot of people won't come to Jesus because they feel like they're wretched and rotten. Right? They don't understand you can come rotten. And it's okay, right? Remember that song we sang? Right? Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. Right? Anything, anything that you are, he, 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 he receives you with open arms, right? But some people are thinking, man, he can't love me. I'm, I did this. I did that. I, da, 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 right? And what the Bible says is if the people can look at us and see, God's math doesn't add up, okay? You can't take a Happy Meal and feed 5,000 people. It just doesn't work. And it doesn't work here, but it does. Somehow, the world who's lost and hurting will see the way we love one another and realize that Jesus is the Messiah and that God loved them as much. This is the mind blow. Listen. As much as God the Father loves Jesus. Those people out there that have not come to the cross yet because they think they're wretched and rotten, they all would know that God the Father loves God the Son. Like, there's not a whole lot of doubt in that, that God the Father loves Jesus. But what the Bible is saying here is that God the Father loves those rotten, wretched sinners as much as he loves Jesus. Boom, right? And, and how will they know that? By you going out and telling them? Yes. But more so than that, they'll know that. Here's where the math doesn't add up. What we do here, the way we love one another, is going to point out to them that Jesus is the Messiah and that God loves them as much as he loves Jesus. So you, you understand the importance of the church and this loving unity that we're trying to pull off? That if we make it the priority of our life and let these words sink in and change the way we think, the impact that it can have on the world, it's amazing. Our love for one another, our togetherness, our unity, our oneness, our commitment to one another, our serving one another, our loving family unit on display for the world to see makes God visible like nothing else in all the creation. It makes God's love for the lost most visible. And it proves above all other things, listen, that Jesus is the Messiah. So let's get practical. When we in fight, and, and, and bark at each other and bite each other and Facebook each other to death as Christians, which I'm guilty of, and that's why I'm not on Facebook anymore. But as we do that, trying to hold on to what we think is the truth, which is cool, 
Truth is important, amen? But as we hold on to what we think is most important and we slaughter our other Christian brothers and sisters, that's not something that attracts the lost to Jesus. It, yeah, boom. It sends them running. The way that they're going to know that Jesus is the Messiah is by the way we love one another. Our love for one another is God's great love for the world displayed. And the world's access to that love is made most visible. And that access is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And it's made available, <laughs> it's made available when we clothe ourselves with tender-hearted mercy and kindness and humility, and gentleness, and patience, and allowing for each other's faults, right? And forgiving offense, and loving one another in a way that says, you don't have to be exactly like me for me to love you, and that's okay. You know why? Because Christ is in you, and that's all that matters. That's all that matters. I don't see your color. I don't see your age. I don't see your gender. I don't see your nationality. I don't see your bank account. I don't see your career. I don't see what kind of car you drive. I don't care what neighborhood you live in. Those things don't matter. We are all, every one of us, a mess that God loved, and now Christ is in us all, and that's all that matters. And outside these walls are a broken, divided, hate-filled, angry, chaotic people. They are in the dark. Our world out there is dark, dark, dark. And so, church, I want to encourage you more than ever. Let's be the light. Let's show the world how to fix this darkness by being a church that really loves beyond the borders set up by our culture. Now is the single greatest time, the single greatest opportunity to advance Christ's kingdom that we'll ever have in our lifetimes. I promise you that. We don't need to waste time trying to figure out new classes and new ministries and do we feed them and clothe them and outreach and events and more classes and more programs and different laws and new presidents and all these we don't we need to quit trying to figure out how to fix our world when God has shown us the fix for the world and it's Jesus Christ the Lord and and he has made evident to this lost and hurting world by the way that we love one another. Amen? Amen? I want to pray with you now, and I want to pray intentionally. I want to pray personally. So I want you to bow your heads for a moment because I don't want you to be distracted. I don't want you to look at me anymore. So the Bible says that, it says this, search my heart, O oh God. Search my heart, O oh God. My, my, be careful that your teaching and your life are the same. So there's things that we know and there's things that we've learned, but there's not things that we're doing. So I want you to pray personally, even though I'm praying out loud, but I want you to pray personally. What, what does, okay, where have I not shown love? Where have I not shown love? To the, to the folks in my church, the, the other Christians that I know that God has placed me together with. I mean, do I, do I care about them? Do I call them? Do I text them? Do I go out and hang out with them? Do I pack my stuff and run out the door as soon as the service is over? Am I serving them? Am I giving to them? Am I helping them? Am I praying for them? Am I spending time with them? Or as my, one of my favorite authors, Francis Chan, says, or are our relationships at church about as deep as those who attend a movie together?
So, Father, where have, where have I? Forget everyone else in the room right now, Lord. What about me? Where have I sh- lacked the love? Where have I lacked the oneness that exists between the Father and the Son? What is church to me? Is it a weekly event that I come to to, 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 to to get pumped back up again so that I can make it through my week? Or are we a body of believers that love one another and live life out together and help each other and spend time and I come to encourage people and serve them and help them and love them? What am I, what am I doing here? And how can I do better? a lot of weight, Lord, that you've kind of put on us, that we are the way that the world's going to see God. We are the way that the world is going to know that Jesus is the Messiah, the one sent from heaven to save them, and that you love these people that are so far from you, that curse your name, that you love them. They'll know these things by the way we love each other. That math, God, doesn't add up in our mind, but it's what you said, and what you said is true. Help us to live according. Change us, Lord. Please change us. Now, Lord, as we continue in our worship, we're going to give. That's a practical way of showing love 